Okay, hello and welcome to the 2022 Well Lecture. I'm delighted <coughs> to welcome Evan Johnson uh, to deliver it this year. Um, Evan's one of the finest composers around today. He works at the extremes of density, sparsity, quietude, fragility and degrees of haticity. Um, and his music's been performed at all the major international festivals, including Huddersfield yesterday that some of you might have attended. He's also a, a writer and reviewer for academic uh, journals and publishers. I've known him for almost exactly 20 years, um, both uh, back in the day uh, as colleagues, but also as lunch companions at the Schloss Solitude Stuttgart Composer Course in 2003. And while we appear a little spiky with each other on, uh, on social media, uh, <laughs> it's all done in love, really. Um, today his talk is called uh, Love de Touche, and it's about his recent keyboard music with the context of your other music as well. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, well, hi, everyone, and I want to thank Professor Mick for, <laughs> for inviting me, for having me here. Um, it is strange to be at the age now where I can say I've known people for 20 years, um, and we both look different than we did when we first met and this sort of thing, but that's, that's how time works, I guess, um, which is also going to be something I talk about a little bit today. So there's a good segue for you. Um, I called this talk today, L'Arc Touche, The Art of Touch, uh, for three reasons, um, all of them sort of overlapping more or less. The first, the sort of the concrete one is that I just finished a CD project that has that as its title, and so this, this phrase was in front of my eyes in very stressful, stressful circumstances for a long time, um, and I kept seeing it in my dreams and nightmares and um, all these sorts of things. Um, it involves a set of three pieces, which are not for, for keyboard, as it happens, that have that as sort of a shared title for the secular three works. Um, that the second reason is having to do with those pieces and where that title comes from. Um, La Touche de Clavecin, which was a um, treatise by Francois Couperin, the great French uh, keyboard composer, that he wrote in 1716. Um, the pieces on the disc don't have any harpsichord. Um, I'm not going to be talking about harpsichords today in any specific fashion, but Couperin's Art Touche is well, it's a manual that's kind of dry and boring in a lot of ways. It's a manual of fingerings and interpretation of ornamental signs um, and fingerings of those ornamental signs for the uh, harpsichord practice of 17th century French sort of institutional keyboard culture, along with a little, um, a little collection of modest pieces that serve as examples, basically. Um, but this talk today is going to be about keyboard practice and what it means to me and the, my history of thinking about it and confronting it, um, literally an art of touching. And then the third reason is because literally of what the phrase means in French as in English, you know, touching is literally of course about manipulating keys, but it's also about feeling, um, about touching someone's, you know, emo touching someone emotionally, about affecting them, um, as well as in a keyboard specific sense, playing. And so the point is that when I talk about as I sort of gave the subtitle of this talk today, it was going to be some recent keyboard music. Um, I'm thinking a lot about the intersection of those two things, that everything about the word touche in all the senses, both the technical, literally how the keys are touched, and also what that means to me and what it means to my work and how it sort of blossoms into a wider way of thinking about music and time and expression more broadly. Um, and also about how thinking about what it means to touche the clavecin, touche the piano, has led me down the sort of path through keyboard style that finally, after two decades, basically, of writing for piano, and then avoiding writing for the piano as much as I could, and then coming back to it later, um, how it's settled into a place that I can sort of inhabit, and that, for me, feels like a comfortable place to, to live as a musician and to go forward from. Um, so the last time I was in Yorkshire, was actually for the Huddersfield Festival in 2019, the last time there was a full-scale full, full scale Huddersfield Festival. And I gave a talk there at Huddersfield about an orchestral piece that I had recently written called Measurement as Contrition. And the basic gist of that talk was that I had had a lot of trouble writing for orchestra um, because my way of thinking about music, my way of thinking about what's important to me in music, in the act of composition, as a listener, as a performer, although I'm not a performer in any public sense, felt totally incompatible with the idea of the orchestra. Um, the orchestra has mass and its hierarchies and its bright colors and its public nature, its institutional nature, 
it's a ratio of the individual personal musical experience. And the end of that story was that I wrote an orchestra piece and I wound up pretty happy with it and I'm still pretty happy with it, um, which for me is saying something. Um, but here I am back in Yorkshire three years later talking about other pieces entirely and the story is actually kind of similar. Um, at least the outlines are in that the idea of writing for piano gave me a lot of trouble for a long time because it still, again, also felt totally incompatible with what interested me as a composer, um, what interested me about music, really, um, in a fundamental way, for reasons that have a lot to do, a lot to say about my work more generally. And for me, I think, having thought about this, both for this event today and more broadly, a lot of it comes back to an idea that I started to label as the idea of mastery. Um, I'd say in general, one reason I like to talk about my work in situations like this is that it gives me a chance to step back from it, you know, to look at it from outside, um, to think about what makes it go, and more precisely to think about what makes it go in terms that are fundamental enough, to be general enough, to be of even potential interest to someone besides myself, um, and that these talks encourage the discovery or the invention of new ways of thinking for myself, new words, concepts, new ways of framing things, and today's, you know, for this, for this round, um, that idea is mastery. So what do I mean by mastery? Um, for a long time, I talked about my work in terms of things like unclarity, or fogs, or scrims, or veils, or margins, or things, about things not coming through, about enforcing distance between, distance from the audience, of course, but also distance between musical material and the performers, between um, musical material and, you know, between me and the score, between the score and the performers, about keeping things unclear and ambiguous and hard to grasp and just out of reach and on and on and on. And I still think about things in those terms um, in ways I think, as will become clear, is pretty clear in the work for those of you who haven't heard it before. But at the same time, I've been finding myself in recent years, I feel like this is sort of a, a midlife crisis thing for me, um, wanting to think about my work in less abstract terms, right? Less in sort of general concepts like distance or unclarity, which are very, you know, in a way, very sort of bloodless terms. And I find myself thinking about it in literally when I'm writing things down, I'm writing in sketchbooks and things, thinking about it in more, in much less abstract terms and not just um, more specific and less abstract in terms of notes and rhythms and pre-compositional devices, um, not less abstract in the sense of having more to do with concrete musical things, but having more to do with sort of the human experience in a way. Um, in terms of the lived experience of things and behaviors and reactions and the way things act in, you know, in life. And so I think of my work these days a lot, and I write down words a lot in my, in my books, and I do things in terms of my own mental modeling, things like stuttering and stumbling and sleepwalking and getting and being lost and being unsure, as if the music material, the musical material were sort of sentient, you know, we're sort of um, feeling things in real time as it proceeds. And so this is clearly the same universe of, you know, of affect, right? Um, stumblings, being lost, fog, you know, all this thing, that's fine. Um, but it's a, it's a different way of framing a, broadly speaking, continuous and broadly similar in a lot of ways body of work. But in this family of categories, this family of categories of sleepwalking, stumbling, stuttering, is this idea of mastery, which has been coming up more and more in this self-directed vocabulary that I've been employing. Um, sort of in private when thinking about making notes for my own work. So again, what does it mean? Um, I don't totally know, but what I do know, as might already be clear, is that for me it's a negative thing. It's something to be avoided. Um, so here's a list of things that mastery can be for me, and um, a list is a first example for me of an anti-magisterial, anti-mastery sort of form. It implies potential incompletion. It implies that something is or could always be missing. But the first one that, I, that occurs to me um, is the idea of mastery as a piece, mastering the time that it inhabits. To master duration, right, which is to make it disappear into a narrative, to disarm duration, to hide duration, which is the goal of kind of all time-based art, you know, not all, but the vast majority of time-based art since time immemorial, at least in, you know, the last few centuries in Europe. A successful piece, right, or a successful film, or a successful short story, a text that can be read in one setting, is one that succeeds in making us forget, in retrospect, that time has passed, right? You look up and all of a sudden it's 20 minutes later or whatever, um, because of course one word for the contemporaneous real-time knowledge that time is passing is boredom, um, for better or worse. But 
Um, of all the things that have sort of stuck with me, stuck in me from the American experimental tradition in particular, and I went to grad school in Buffalo, um, the US, which is sort of the former stomping grounds of Morton Feldman, so I sort of, I was brought up in the sort of American experimental New York school tradition, in some sense, of Feldman and Cage and so forth. The most fundamental um, thing of that, you know, that musical subculture that has stuck with me is this idea of letting time be time, of letting the passage of time over the course of a musical work um, impinge upon musical material, inflect it, weigh it down, um, distort it in all sorts of ways and at all sorts of scales. Um, it can mean a lot of different things, but basically what it means is this rejection of the ideal of music mastery of time, the rejection of the ideal of music's dominance over time and sort of <laughs> its destruction of time. Um, I like time and, you know, all the things that, for example, John Cage showed us, some of which I'm very deeply skeptical of, uh, and some of which resonate with me pretty profoundly. The one that resonates the most profoundly is, is the way that he did just that from sort of his earliest work back in the sort of prepared piano dance studio in, in Seattle days of taking time you know, into his work and letting time shape the material, letting time get in the way of the material, not uh, avoiding the instincts to have, um, to have the material do the work of erasing our experience of time. And I think that you can define experimental music that way in a sense trying to define experimental music. Um, for me, maybe the best way to define it is um, music that avoids the temptation of mastering time. So mastery here is erasure, right? Um, and so the rejection of this version of mastery, in other words, the incorporation of time and the feeling of time, the awareness of its passage into the work, happens in my music on every scale, um, as I've already mentioned, from the you know, internal um, to every gesture, to every event, to every microscopic turn of phrase, to the larger scale of how, um, you know, how 20 minutes or 30 minutes or 40 minutes might pass. Um, this is something that will become, I think, pretty clear, particularly in the last piece, the most recent piece I played for you today. But it's it's there, I think, everywhere. Um, and so that's definition one of mastery. Definition two is kind of definition one a, um, but it stems from an experience I had recently, like just a couple of weeks ago. I uh, I was listening to a record, a new, a new record of music by the composer John Lely, who I don't know if some of you may know. Um, or I think he's by any definition an experimental composer. Um, and I'm not trying, going to try to describe this music for you, but it's, you should hear it, it's wonderful, but you know, it's at least this, the works on this, on this record that I was listening to, broadly speaking, it's simple, it's straightforward, takes up a lot of time, um, it's beautiful, and it, so it, it leaves time exposed, sort of in the way I've just been talking about. Um, you don't tend to listen to a piece by John Lilly and, and sort of forget the time has passed. And suddenly, while listening to this record just a couple of weeks ago and thinking about these pieces later, um, I found myself with this distinction between two types of music and two types of composers, which I, uh, which I found myself sort of linking to these sort of two old, these sort of hoary old modes of um, poetic rhetoric and form, which are the epic and the lyric. And epic being that's which, that which is driven by narrative, taken very broadly, or metaphorically, maybe I just mean teleological, goal-directed, pointing in a particular direction from the get-go, um, considering the end of a time-based artistic experience of some sort as a inevitable function of the beginning, right? Through whatever musical means, in the case of music. And lyric being a mode of existing in time which is not overtly or overwhelmingly or fundamentally directional. Um, so by my little provisional definition, experimental music is ipso facto sort of a lyrical, or it's, it's lyric, and Cage becomes the prime example of a composer of lyric um, with antecedents and Satie and maybe, you know, Chopin, WC, I, I haven't thought this through, obviously, but, you, you know, maybe you see what I'm getting at. But there's another level here, too. Um, this idea of epic and lyric modes of temporal art making, which again is talking about this idea of temporal mastery. It maps into a whole other constellation of affects and attitudes. I'm getting back to talking about emotions again. Um, the epic mode, again, about being dominating time, mastering time, conquering time, conquering the listener, co-opting their life. Um, I don't want to put a political or moral tinge on this sort of thing, but you could if you were so inclined. Um, the epic composer, epic composition being tied to the very idea of a masterpiece, right? The very idea of force as a musical or artistic or aesthetic virtue. So overwhelming and erasing the listener's sense of time passing. You know, we use the phrase, you know, we get carried away. Nothing with that means, 
you know, you, you get <laughs> your body being picked up and carried away. It's not, it shouldn't necessarily be a pleasant thing. Anyway, um, and that's all well and good. And again, that's how the vast majority of the greatest works of temporally situated European art of the, you know, modern and pre-modern era, you know, are designed to work. But then we remember the alternatives. And this lyric mode is the anti-mastery mode. It's the mode of acknowledging time, decorating and coloring it in the spirit not of domination, but of like generosity, right? Um, the idea of supplication. Please consider this. Consider time as you know. Consider donating to me this chunk of your life and allow me to tinge it for you, to color it for you, um, without you know kidnapping you in the process, metaphorically speaking. Um, there's a new book of writings by Joe Kondo, incidentally, that just came out from Music Text. That's really, really um, beautiful and talks about just this sort of thing, about composition and. Um, performing and audienting or whatever being in the audience there's not really a good verb for that um, as a collaborative act which I think is precisely the sort of thing that I'm getting at um, and in this sense you know these works of cage these time-based works 433 sure why not becomes a prototypical lyric right of the super spare bundle visor pieces the Mumford Verde pieces where you have one note on the piano in the midst of this enormous sea of silence it's just you know Here's give me some time and allow me to to put a little bit of weight on it, you know, to put a little bit of um, specialness to it, and then you can get on with your life. It's a very different way, I think, of again, not speaking of emotions, speaking of affect, speaking of the way that music you know, works on us. It's a very uh, for me, it's a very appealing thing. And then there's one more definition, which is another sort of important one, and then we'll get to some music. Speaking of mastery again as erasure, and that's the idea of instrumental mastery, the virtuosic ideal, right? This idea of the virtuosic musical performance as the illusion that the instrument does not in itself exist, that there's no barrier between the performer's action and the sound event that results, that there are no tensions, there are no internal boundaries, there's no structure, there's no grid of limitations or obstacles, but the instrument sort of melts into amorphousness and becomes, you know, putty in the hands of a dominating performer of sufficiently transcendent physical genius or whatever. Um, and this is what virtuosity is, the idea that the instrument can disappear into pure, transparent um, vessel, vesselage. And that's, that idea is something that my music has always, more or less from day one, by which I mean 2002 or so, tried to undermine in a lot of different ways. Um, I've tried to make those grids of limitations or obstacles that the instrument presents um, an overt feature of the surface of the work, um, of the means and the goals and the meaning of that non erasure has fluctuated a lot in the last two decades. So, in general, I guess I'm arriving at the idea that I'm using the term mastery to mean the illusion of the liquidation of obstacles, right, or difficulties or frailties. And now I sense myself sort of drifting back to a conceptual vocabulary that I've used to describe my work and my working methods for a long time. So, what's to be gained from this particular term? Um, for me, it brings together a couple of things that I'm trying, sort of guided by instinct, guided by a sort of pre-logical aesthetic inclination to do with my work. In other words, you know, a couple of things that are brought to bear by my style, such as it is, um, which is to consider mastery as illusion, right? The illusion that time has not passed, the illusion that instruments do not present obstacles, physical obstacles to performers. And I'm interested in removing illusion, in making time felt both by listeners by the work itself, metaphorically speaking, as it sort of stumbles forward and attempts to fill the time allotted to it, and in making the instrument and its resistance a sort of active participant in the musical rhetoric. Those are two different things, the time thing and the instrument thing. They don't necessarily go together inherently, um, but they're tied together for me by this particular knot, right, by this particular common ground, by this shared concept or justification. Um, so by now, um, you may be wondering, as I was at this point, what this has to do with the piano, what this has to do with writing for keyboard. And the answer, the link that occurred to me gradually as I was along with sort of all this other stuff, is in a sense sort of inherently objective and personal and may not resonate with, may or may not resonate with all of you, um, which is that the piano, for me, as an instrument, embodies all these elements, these aspects of mastery, inherently, as an object. All these things my work has been defining itself against um, sort of unknowingly and maybe only in retrospect for a couple of decades now. And the reason for this, for me, from you know the way I come to these things is quite simple, which is that every other standard or orchestral instrument at least, you know, involves or rewards or is designed to respond to a continuous application of force, right, in purely concrete terms. 
on at least two planes at once. You have the breath, you have the keying fingers, you have the stopping finger and the bow, you have, um, I guess, that's it. Um, um, and as a result of this, there's a possibility of this permanent state of contingency when you're playing these instruments, right? There's a permanent state of potential fluctuation. There's a permanently renewable instability that all my work of the last decade or so at least takes as a, as a, you know, a, a precondition. Timbre can always fluctuate. It can always be ornamented. It can always be otherwise. Um, the conditions that create a full traditional 19th century virtuosic tone are always on display in a negative sense, are always potentially untrustworthy. Um, this is the avoidance, or this, you know, this is the, the aspect of the, um, the import of instrumental mastery. In other words, the forces that create the sounding result in these instruments, in the violin or a oboe or whatever else, the muscles and the breath and the tensions and the pressures, they can always be dysregulated. They can always be unsteady. Um, mastery of this instrumental sort has to be continually reasserted. And if that foregrounds the muscles, it foregrounds effort, it foregrounds the attempt at things, it foregrounds the performer's subjectivity and ornament, it foregrounds the potential for things being otherwise. Um, and it foregrounds the concrete particular of every passing moment. And particularly when there are long held events, as there often are in my string writing in particular, it, it, it foregrounds the passage of time in a, in a purely sort of physical sense, the effort of time. All of my instrumental writing does this and the piano can't really do any of this. It's, um, I keep staring at this piano and sort of <laughs> with disgust. Um, <laughs> the piano has always sort of felt to me like a black box in a way. In, in normal piano technique, to a reasonable approximation, continued bodily contact is relatively meaningless, right? In terms of the individual event, there's no input there. The progression of the event in the piano tied to any one physical impulse is inevitable and is predetermined and to some sense monolithic. Um, and for me, that instinct, that, that feeling about the piano has always been a fundamental obstacle. So one way of framing that everything that I've brought up so far and everything that I'm going to bring up later in terms of my actual work, um, one way of framing that, my art to touche, like when it comes to writing for the keyboard, has everything to do with undermining mastery, with avoiding its inherent certainties, its predictabilities, um, its invisibilities, its, its attempts to make things invisible. I needed to find an instrumental technique that was working in tandem with my sort of general attitude, right? my instinct, my general um, approach to stumbling, stuttering, ornamental approaches to time and gesture and form. And it really becomes, over the course of you know, a couple of decades of making various attempts at this, it becomes literally an art touche, an art of touching, literally touching the keys, touching the material, touching as material, right? Um, touching, in the expanded sense, also the sensibilities of the performer, to listen to everyone in the sort of messed up, multi-leveled universe of musical reception, who isn't me, um, by expressifying the passage of time itself. Um, so I'm going to start by showing you sort of where this, um, where this process started with what, I, you know, what I've labeled here as a, a failed attempt to address this situation, um, which is this piece. Um, there's some time. There it is. Um, from 20 years ago. A lot of things about my work have changed in the past 20 years. Um, this is a period that begins around the time I was entering grad school. Um, but here are some things that have not changed. I was and I am interested in muscles and sinews, and I tend to think of instruments as what they literally physically are, which are machines for amplifying and focusing muscular efforts, taking inputs in the form of pressures and distensions, um, potential energies of various sorts, pressures from the fingers, from the arm, via the bow, from the lungs, and filtering them and amplifying them with a, you know, extreme degree of efficiency, essentially. And I've always been interested in the ways in which those amplification processes that the instruments manifest become frail or unsteady or in some sense insufficient. Um, I'm attracted to, I, I wouldn't even say I'm interested in because it's not an intellectual thing at all. It's just an instinct. It's what happens when I think about these things. I'm attracted to what I described above as an anti-magisterial approach to gesture and form, making things stumble and stutter, to interrupting things, distending things, preventing things from proceeding smoothly in a musical sense. And those would be the only two things that have stayed consistent in my keyboard writing for the past two decades, or all my other writing for that matter. Um, so as an example of that, here is this first 
as I said, a failed attempt. Um, there's a piece from 2002, 2003, which again, I wrote when I was 22 years old. It's a piece in six movements. And I'm going to play the first movement, which is that in its entirety, um, and the second movement, which is much longer, and then the last movement. Um, these movements are of wildly varying length, as I just implied. Some are only a minute or less. The second movement's seven minutes long, and so on and so forth. Um, but the physicality in this piece, the way of being with the keyboard, the way of getting around what even then I think I was instinctively seeing as this forbidding black, black box mechanism, um, the arts touche of, the, of this piece is about violence. It's about aggression, and it's about frustration, um, and it's about obstruction, which is true of a lot of my work from, from this era and for the next five or six years. It's about too much input into the instrumental machine. Um, it's about insistence, horizontal insistence, insistence over the course of time, and vertical insistence, you know, insistence in individual events. Um, when the muscularity of the performer's practice can't be contained gracefully enough to be filtered because it is excessive. Uh, it's one kind of sort of dramatization or instantiation of a frustration with the keyboard, of its inability to, to do something, right, to filter efficiently these, these muscular inputs. Um, and anyway, I will play, I'll play the first, second, and sixth movements of this, and then we will proceed. So this is Decent Flocum This is this and everything else you want to hear today, by the way, is from a recording of my complete keyboard music by Ben Smith, who's this absolutely marvelous young London-based pianist who, uh, who played another, a new piece of mine yesterday as well. Um, so this is Dichissons Flottement from 2002. I can get this to get going. Thank you. 
Okay, so this piece from 20 years ago, in, in its own sort of not particularly subtle um, way, is about violence, right? it's about awkwardness. You, I didn't really take the time to go through the, the notational things, I don't know if they're clear or not at all, but in the last one in particular, there's a lot of choreography about the, about the use of elbows and wrists and specified angle between the elbow and the, the wrist angle where the elbow appears in the keyboard, and there are a lot of fingerings given, as you saw, they're intentionally awkward. Um, and it's very, uh, as, as, you know, as clearly sort of partially intended to disrupt the illusion of virtuosity, right, or to, to, make it, to make impossible the performance or the production of virtuosity. And in the second movement at the beginning, you know, one of the things the second movement does is it begins with this, you know, intermittent explosions of also elbow and 
forearm and fist clusters and things that die out into this general sort of stumbling, sleepwalking malaise, I guess, of, you know, just uh, stumbling around this more or less static lattice of pitches going on in the background. None of those are terms I necessarily would have used except for awkwardness and violence 20 years ago, but that's how I see it now. Um, and that, you know, that trill, this tremolo thing at the end is, again, I, you know, how I would have articulated it at the time, I don't remember, but it's clear as, you know, now an attempt to um, undermine a sense of coherent finality to the piece. You know, it literally says, you know, finalità, without, without finality, um, to make sure that the piece does not end in a graceful fashion, to make sure that nothing in this last movement in particular happens in a graceful fashion. It's awkward, it's ugly, um, it's painful to play, is generally ungrateful to experience for all concerned, which is precisely the intent. Um, yeah, and uh, so this, you know, this is me as, a, as an obnoxious grad student, you know, at, at 22, grappling instinctively with these same problems. These problems that, you know, the piano is not an interesting, interesting instrument for me. It can't do what I want it to do. Um, and so I'm trying to overload its input, right? I'm trying to um, disrupt the circuitry that makes it possible for it to presume produce this illusion of mastery and this illusion of virtuosity um, through the sense of frustration of excessive and misdirected and failed energy, which is really characteristic of all my work at the time, for, for piano or otherwise. And so I, I describe this as something of a failed attempt, and I, you know, it's not that it's a bad piece, I don't think it's a bad piece, um, it's probably not bad for a 22-year-old, you know, I've been recorded and so forth, but this thing, right, this theme about a mismatch between performative energies and the instrument's ability to absorb them and amplify them. Um, this misdirection, again, it was one of the core generating principles of my work for a while. Um, but here it, it strikes me now, in retrospect, on the, uh, you know, these decades of distance, as a fairly blunt instrument, a fairly blunt approach. Um, it doesn't undo or, or reconstitute the piano's technique in a, in a, in a further, in a sort of uh, more broadly fruitful fashion. It's sort of purely negative in a way. It's purely violent. It's purely frustrated. It's it's purely an attempt to tear things down and not to build things up, um, which means it's again characteristic attitude of a graduate student. But now, from the with the with the, the the cool autumnal wisdom of middle age, I'm more interested in I suppose in building things, um, <laughs> at least making more you know sort of fruitful ways of proceeding. So now I'm going to turn. I'm going to skip some years and proceed to some what I've written down here as some more successful attempts. Um, yes, the, that question of misdirected energies, as I've mentioned several times by now, has it, it continued to haunt me. Um, that misdirection that undermines instrumental mastery, um, in conjunction with, in alliance with, even though I didn't really realize it, I don't think at the time, with this anti-magisterial gestural language, this stumbling, this stuttering, um, and the anti-magisterial form in this piece, in the Isthmus Flotement. Um, I mentioned there are six movements of wildly varying lengths, for instance, and I didn't mention this, but you kind of saw it between the first two, that in several cases there are five movement breaks that make up the six movements, but those movement breaks, they're often um, in the middle of the piece before they skip. They cut off material arbitrarily, essentially, and the next one picks up where the previous one left off. Um, so, you know, that's a large-scale example from, from a long time ago of me uh, trying to undermine the sense of time passing in a smooth and illusionistic fashion. Um, anyway, this variety of constantly misdirected energies, looking for a way around, beyond, into this black box of physical piano technique, looking for a way to project a distrust of mastery in a timbral sense, a technical sense, a micro-level sense. Alongside that, um, there's another element of the enforcement of pianistic mastery that I turned my focus to when I returned to the piano after a pretty significant hiatus. Um, there was a piece for just a couple years after this one that involved a, uh, a piece or piano with noise, with a static on like a set tape that is kind of like the last movement of this piece, but even more so. It's all about elbows and arms, and um, it, it makes incredibly loud cluster noises and things, most of which you can't hear because the white noise on the tape is even louder. So I, I upped the obnoxious quotient quite significantly in this piece a couple of years later. <laughs> And then I, the noise cuts off a couple of times and play these fluttery little cannons, then it goes back to what I was doing. But after that piece in 2005, um, there's a gap of a few years. And in that gap, one of the things that I started to become interested in was a misdirection of energies in kind of the opposite way, not in a sense of excess, sort of destructful, destructive, destructive, stressful, violent, sometimes painful, literally, 
um, frustrating excess, but in a sense, instead of insufficiency. I'm thinking about instruments in the way I alluded to earlier as these sort of um, prodigiously efficient resonating machines, amplifying machines, exquisitely engineered, unbelievably potent, um, perhaps the concert grand piano most of all. But I started to become interested in insufficient inputs into that machine, and not just into pianos. Situations in which the resonance, the sort of artificial projection of sonic dominance, right, of mastery again, if you like, is starved, right, sort of underfed. And as a result, the instrumental technique becomes a sort of thing that hangs in the air around the instrument that never becomes fully absorbed into the maw of the machine, as <laughs> take, taken as food for the machine um, to reproduce, and amplify, and, and disgorge, you could say. Um, and I, so I'm not going to play a little tiny piece from 2010. So, you know, seven or eight years after this one, which is, could not be more different, really, in what it does with the piano. It's this very strange little piece, but it's a, it's a micro miniature from 2010. It's a good example, and it's a, in retrospect, sort of a surprising, surprisingly accurate harbinger of things to come in more substantial ways a decade later or so. This is a, um, a sub one minute piece, really a sub 30 second piece, called Quill, which is, you know, let me pull it up here in its entirety. Quill is um, the, well, it's an old English word for a while, or you know, a small chunk of time. Um, my wife is a aesthetic theorist of quite some brilliance, if you ask me. She's a writer on film and broader issues of form and meaning in visual media, and we've never collaborated on anything except in this one particular instance where she um, published an article about the phenomenon of near inaudibility in, uh, in film. And uh, asked to, and for some reason they agreed to include this as a figure in her article. And so this little piece was actually never meant to be performed. Uh, it was made as insert for this article. But then when Ben um, proposed me the idea of making this recording of my piano music, he wanted to include this, and, and um, he insisted on including it because he's crazy. And I said, <laughs> I said no, and then I said, Fine, you know, whatever. And so, <laughs> and then, and so he did. And, uh, and, uh, and of course, what happened, you can imagine what happened. I got really, I became really attached to this, and I actually am quite happy with how it sounds. And I don't think he's played it in concert since, but I wouldn't put it past him to do someday. Anyway, but the point here is that this little piece, um, again, written as a, as a laboratory experiment, really, is all about this new variety of misdirected energies. Their fingers mismatched to keys, that they tap on the keys, click with the keys, um, sort of very, very delicately tangled with the keys in ways you're not necessarily meant to be delicately tangled with. Um, the body mismatched to the instruments. There's control of, as you may see, of the performer's breath in this piece, their inhalation and exhalation as they sit at the keyboard. Um, a little bit of audible, but very faint and only very weakly pitched whistling. I was like, I don't have a key for all of this notation. I don't actually have one because, again, it wasn't meant to be performed. I had to make one for Ben 10 years later and try and decode my own notation. <laughs> I feel I like this idea of, of uh, compositionally controlling the breath and bodily phenomena of a pianist's being, or other non-woodwind performer. Um, this haunted, it's been in the back of my mind for a long time, and I, I did it here in this very limited context. I've never done it again, but I kind of want to, even though it's obviously a terrible idea. Um, anyway, here is what Quill sounds like. Um, and now, for the sake of argument and illustration, um, I'll play another small piece from eight years later, so now we're, now we're almost to the present day, finally, from 2018, that is a sort of a more fleshed out example of a similar approach to keyboard writing. It's still a very short piece, under three minutes, and a sort of spare and silence filled and stumbling three minutes at that. Um, but this is a piece called we written for the 50th birthday of the pianist Ian Pace, who was also the dedicatee of the, the original piece in 2002. We had a great deal of influence on and support for my, my writing when I was just starting out. Um, 
the title, Culture of Men, is from a chanson by Guillaume Dufay from the 15th century. It's, it's actually a celebration of the new year, which is not the right kind of celebration um, for a birthday greeting. But this particular line is about may, is, um, basically, may joy be bestowed upon you. Um, the you is supposed to be a king on the new year, but now it depends on his 50th birthday, so you know, close enough. Um, and the, the material of the piece is also taken from that chanson, um, albeit very distortedly. So here is Kenjoa on vue de Mani. Okay, so we're almost to the main event here, which is sort of the, the piano piece I wrote for this recording project, actually, a couple of years ago. That's my most substantial piano piece, solo piano piece, since the early ones. But I hope that with these two miniatures, the, the sort of normal miniature and the micro-micro miniature, um, I've been framing things in such a way that you can see or hear or you know, detect the commonality of conception, even um, behind some sort of very, very different surfaces. You know, the sort of commonality of conception in a very general sense, the desire to sort of sidestep the seductive, you know, economy of technique and of mechanism that is involved in pianistic mastery, um, to direct the performer sort of slightly askew so as to undo the smooth translation of energies. And at the same time, to also, in a way, um, avoid or, um, you know, think otherwise than the smooth progress of gesture and theme and, and uh, the presentation of material, the sort of constant irregular repetition and stumbling and um, you can see what I mean maybe by the sort of sleepwalking affect that I've been discussing. Again, in very, very different sort of contexts of surface and general demeanor. Um, so, um, what I really set out to want to talk about to you all today was this piece from 2019-2020 called Mes Pleurons. Um, this, and I want to talk about this piece because to me it is sort of the first time, really, that I felt like I've gotten somewhere, <laughs> that I've, <laughs> that I've um, managed to come up with a world of piano technique that is consistent with my instincts as to what makes my music 
interesting to myself um, in a way that makes it um, that, that is sufficiently developed and sufficiently flexible and subtle and uh, multi faceted that I can actually start the much harder process maybe of building a language of um, sort of rebuilding idea of piano performance away from the illusionistic master virtuosity and at the same time in that context building a sense of pianistic gesture and pianistic sort of phrase making that also looks for a way a detour around the idea of sort of temporal mastery of making time disappear um, and then you know i'm pretty happy with how it turned out as i've i'm usually self-critical to a truly exhausting degree so that is that's saying something um, but before i play the piece i want to talk a little bit about it in particular uh, in addition to Place it in some more general terms of the current state of my research, right? The current state of my search for a productive art touche over the last couple of decades. Um, and as usual, starting with the title, which is always a good place to start. Um, the title is. That's not the beginning, that's where it's going to start. The title is Mes Plurons, My Weepers. Um, Plurons were a little sort of specialized genre of sculpture found most commonly, most sort of prominently in 15th century Burgundy in North, what is now Northern France and part of Belgium. Um, this also happens to be, of course, during the heyday of the great composers of the Low Countries and the Josquin of the era. And also the heyday of manuscript illumination of Bokeru. You know, it was a good time to be a artist to the, to the ruling classes. So it was never a bad time to be an artist to the ruling classes, but it's a good time to be an artist to the ruling classes um, in, in Europe in that area. But this is a tradition that also existed elsewhere in Western Europe, and what they are is they are sculptures, um, usually less than a meter tall, but sometimes life size, sometimes just reliefs, in fact, of mourning people, people in mourning, um, that were made in groups to adorn the tombs of prominent dead, obviously, uh, personages. Um, I'm living in Amsterdam right now, and I was also had just been living in Amsterdam when I was working on this piece. And sort of between where we were living, coincidentally, two again, um, and where my son went to daycare, now where he goes to school, was the Rijks Museum. Um, and so I'd often walk through the Rijks Museum basically on the way to drop him off or pick him up. And in the basement of the Rijks Museum, there is a set of Pleurons that accompanied the tomb of Isabella. Here they are, who was the second wife of Charles the Bold, who died in her early 30s in 1465. Um, so those are the weepers sort of ringing the tomb there on the bottom. And these, I've, I've always had sort of particular funds for this little group of sculptures in particular. I visit them often, both because they're on the way home from my kid's school, and also because they have these sort of, um, these variously averted gazes, right? They have these variously inwardly directed energies that still display this astonishing variety of affect and of attitude. Um, it's a, this, this particular set of Pleuron and the genre as a whole is all about, is a virtuosic display of indirection, right? And I think, you know, given everything that I've been saying, and maybe some of the work that you've heard, especially the recent pieces, the appeal is clear. Um, why the same instinct that makes me write like that, although, you know, makes me find these, this genre of sculpture very appealing. So, those are the plural. The piece itself is in four parts. There's a central pair of movements that are attached to one another. And there are also a pair of what I've called satellites, which is not a term I'm totally happy with, but it's too late now. Um, and this, the two satellites have to be played in order the first before the second, uh, but the second is not to be played directly after the first, and neither of them is to be played bef directly before or after the pair of main movements. So I'm going to simulate, attempt to simulate that mode of presentation here, starting in a moment. So you have satellite one, some other pieces, main movements, some other pieces, satellite tips of the piece sort of spread throughout a program. Um, and the satellites are fragmentary transcriptions, sort of. Um, or at least sort of relatively translucent readings through a ballad called Sisephorus of Jupiter by a guy named Magister, aka Master, which is a coincidence, um, Master Grimas, who lived about a hundred years before the Florence were, um, were sculpted, sometime in the mid to late 14th century, sort of, we think he was maybe a younger contemporary of Machot, although we don't really know anything about him. We have five small pieces by this guy Grimas, but we don't know anything about his life or even really what his name was or when or where he worked. But the same ballad is also the source of the material of the second of the two central movements, somewhat distantly, and then even more distantly of the first of the two central movements. So here I'm first going to play Satellite A, one of the transcriptionary, one of these two transcriptionary satellites. <laughs> 
first satellite. And in terms of technique, in terms of the art touche, right, this is pretty straightforward by my standards, almost sort of polemically straightforward. It's meant to be, in the sense that it's meant to maintain a sense of straightforward lyricism, to be identifiably a transcription, but at the same time to, to strike this balance and also preserve and sort of underline the gestural aspect, sort of the microscopic aspect of the attempts to avoid mastery, the hesitations, right, the stumbling, the little repetitions, the rearticulations, the tiny rests, the inability to sustain a line, right, or to sustain a singing tone. This is, of course, something that would have been sung by three singers and would have sound and does um, sound very different when performed in its original form. But the middle movement, which I'm going to play momentarily, um, the, sort of the, the bulk of the piece, have a much more developed technical vocabulary, uh, an arts touche in a very literal sense, which is satellite flat by design, um, all based around this general goal, this poking around the edges of the piano's designed universe of amplification and resonance. Um, this way of looking for a sort of sonic and muscular vocabulary that has sort of cracks and frailties and microscopic internal stumblings and stutterings and contingencies that appeal to me on the sort of visceral pre-intellectual level. Um, and some of these techniques, and you saw some of them also happened in Huil, some of them happened in all, sort of in Conjois, on the domain, um, but there's this whole array of vocabulary of ta various tappings on the key surface with the fingernail, with the fingertip. There's this technique of lifting the key, um, the little lip on the front of the key, which makes a very gentle sort of funk and quite a bit louder if the piano, if the pedal is depressed. And what there are a lot of, those there actually are here too in these, uh, I could use a fancy pen thing, I'm not going to, in these um, hollow note heads, is a second escapement attack, which are which also appear in Conjoint and Vudemen, and have become sort of a major feature of my piano writing since a duo I did for two pianos in 2013. Um, inside the grand piano mechanism, there's a system that uh, sort of, it resets the hammer before the key is fully released. It was invented by Erard, the piano maker in the 19th century, to make it easier to play repeated notes. Like if you're playing, you know, or on Dean or something, um, it makes it so the, so the act, so you don't have to sort of release the key all the way before restriking it in order for it to make a sound. But you can also abuse this mechanism by gently and slowly and silently half depressing a key. And when you do it, you can feel a little sort of hitch in the mechanism. And when you pass that hitch, and then you depress the key the rest of the way, uh, what happens is the hammer strikes the key from a much um, sort of smaller distance and you get, um, when you depress it the rest of the way, you get this, it's quieter of course, but also has this very beautiful veiled, muted, distant, dull sort of timbre, which I've become quite, quite fond of. It's really a beautiful sound and thankfully it's captured really well, I think, in these recordings. Um, one downside is that it requires <coughs> a very good piano. Um, at the, at the concert yesterday at Huddersfield at at where uh, Ben played a piano part for, for the piece for piano and soprano, which had a lot of the stuff he had to reject the first piano offered to him at the last minute because it wasn't good enough. Um, and then they had to tune it, this whole thing, doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> and the, but the real downside, the local downside, is that it takes a moment or two to prepare, right? Because you have to carefully semi-depress the key before you gently and carefully in the separate motions um, before you can push it the rest of the way. Um, and then finally, there's also a, a, a technique that's used quite a lot in the front where you do that, essentially, one finger will depress the key part way with one hand, and then the other hand will be used to strike it with some force, some degree of energy from, from a distance or whatever, and that way you can get, at the cost of involving both hands and some time to repair, you can get that dull, beautiful, muted, veiled timbre with a more um, violent, energetic, staccato, martellato sort of attack. Um, and a lot of the time, actually, speaking of misdirected energies and attention and detail, muscular control being diverted from the efficient stream of resonant cantabile mastery that the piano was built to provide, a lot of the time the partially depressing finger, including at the very beginning here, has a little dance to do. Right? It wavers on the key. It doesn't. You can see of you can think of a sort of like oops, a silent little trill as these things are. So the line in the middle is the second escapement mechanism engagement point. Um, so the, the key, the protagonist has to do this with the key and sort of wiggle it, you know, presumably silently, although sometimes accidents can happen, which is okay, while it's intermittently attached from above by the other hand, pecked at, as it were. Um, and there are variations and elaborations in all these techniques, and there are more of them, but together as a set, they form this vocabulary of touching, right? This arts touche that I've, that I've sort of developed. 
And you know, I like the sounding result. I like what it allows me to do you know, sort of ornamentally. But also, it appeals to me that, as I probably made clear, all these things, most of them, in fact, they enforce this attitude of hesitation. Right? You have to stop what you're doing and prepare something. Um, it makes it impossible, really, to play a legato phrase. It can't be done. Um, so everything sort of ties together sort of nicely. It, it, makes, it, un, it undermines even the possibility for virtuoso fluency. Um, so yeah, so I will play the two central movements of my journal. They're about 12 minutes long in total, so you can see how it works in practice. So this has been this recording, been this recording of my journal. Uh, yeah, working with the first. Awesome. Thank you. 
Thank you. 
Okay, so very briefly about the material of this piece. I, I mentioned the second movement to some relatively precise but still pretty buried degree um, relative to the satellite anyway, it's based on this Cremas Ballade. And the first movement is two, but several more steps removed. Um, and in general, I have quite a few pieces based, sort of loosely speaking, on medieval and Renaissance sources. And the goal is generally to have the sort of foreignness of the source, the evidence, somehow, vaguely, sort of untouchably, but rarely to float all the way to the surface. Um, but you know, the first movement is more about the sort of denatured piano technique. The second movement is more about the gestural technique, sort of stuttering and stumbling and rests and holes. And, um, but I think all that's clearly sort of extremely clear here. Um, you can sense, I think, especially in the beginning, in the first half or so, the first movement in particular, there's a goal, right? There's a clear horizontal motion, there's a line, there's melody, there's counterpoint, there's a gesture being traversed, but it's traversed so painfully, slowly, and haltingly, and irregularly, and shiveringly, and stutteringly, partially, precisely because of the necessities and exigencies of the, of the keyboard technique, that never quite, get, never quite gets accomplished before it peters out and something else takes its place for the next attempt at, you know, coherent, articulation. And then this bubbles up more to the surface in the second piece, this, the piece that's more just playing on the keys in this in this sort of gesturally um, stumbling fashion. But you have also these sort of flickers of pre-tonal harmony, right? These little fragmentary potential figures and triads and then all this sort of stuff. Um, and I find it really useful, I think, really clarifying to have these goals at hand, to be able to imagine the mastery that's not, that's not accomplished, right? To hint at the latent capabilities of the whole system. The whole system of rhetoric and gesture and material and instrument, um, the hall, the performer, I mean, everything all at once, and then to sort of shine a sort of faint little light on that, and then go back to building this little dusty sculpture in the corner, you know, um, trying to get out of the spotlight like you know, like an insect. Because yeah, the, the spotlight spot has momentarily been, been flicked on. Um, anyway, here is the second satellite. After we've heard another piece or two on the program, ideally. Um, so, there are a few things that I would have loved to discuss here uh, in this context, but couldn't for a lot of time. There's a, a fairly substantial piece for three toy pianos. There's a concerto for, there is in fact a harpsichord piece, a concerto for harpsichord and 12 instruments. Um, there's a small handful of other piano things that I'll get at these same concerns in, in sort of wildly varying ways, but I think this is enough. Um, I think that's sort of sufficiently clear, and I maybe what I mean, hopefully, by Le Touche. By mastery, by the way, those two things are intimately linked for me, and um, how, in retrospect, they form a bit of a map for where I've been going most of the time without realizing it, certainly without um, any desire to frame it in those terms. Um, but in my sort of intermittent attempts to come to grips with the piano, um, I don't know how you feel. I feel like with, with this piece and some others around it involving the piano, I finally have a sense now of how it can work for me. Um, I'm also kind of equally sure that if I come back here in a decade or two, um, I'll feel completely differently and I'll, I'll frame this as one of the failed attempts and I've gone forward with my life. Um, but that, I suppose, is what's supposed to make it, make it fun. Um, that's all I have. So thanks for listening. And if you have questions or thoughts, I'm very excited to hear them. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, <coughs> any questions? I know I've just walked back in the room, so I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but if you haven't already, could we get a nerdily close-up look at a, couple, at a bar or two somewhere? I think particularly for, for students who may not be that familiar with, with your notation, it might yeah. be useful to have a, a walkthrough of some of the things that 
that talk about those kind of the stuttering and the difficulty and the, the thing, the, the way the notational tools you use to do that. Sure. Um, I'm a bar one. Um, I feel like there's also maybe a bit of uh, virtue in talking as briefly as I can, which hopefully is briefly, about notation in general. Um, it's one of my things, you know, I could talk for hours about this, and I have. Um, but I, uh, I put an extremely high value and level of importance on the way music is written down and the way it looks and the way it feels to read and the way it feels to play, the way it feels to sort of, um, to sort of visually encounter. Um, I think, you know, when I, whenever I'm, I'm talking to students, some sort of a, a one to one thing in master classes or whatever, I, I'm always on them quite, quite partially to pay attention to how their scores look and how every element of the score can mean, um, or everything about a score can, can convey aesthetic information, right? Can, can influence the material, can say something about the material, and you know, the crucial thing for me is that it can say something about the material even if it's not entirely clear what it's saying. Um, it, it, it's a way of, of, um, of engaging attention. Um, that's not the reason I write everything by hand, that's not the sort of, come, there are practical reasons for that, and you know, history of that they don't need to get into, but it is an effect of that for me, it's become a thing that creates sort of feedback loop. Or have now become sort of quite um, quite invested in that. I'm similarly with the the detail of everything. Um, as I'm sure you've noticed, um, just looking at a piece from 2002 up through 2019, or whatever the official date of this particular score is, um, there are a lot of two blips. There are a lot of you know difficult rhythmic notation, and that's been fairly constant in my work for, for reasons that are. Uh, that have changed a lot over the years. In the Indecent Flotement, the 20 year old piece, it was, um, there were sort of random fluctuations of a continuous background stream. But now they become much more about dancing, about feeling things, about things being a little bit shifted off from beats, about syncopations. I mean, you'll see a ton of like here and here where, there, where things have, where units have initial rests and the, the event comes a little bit later and things are always sort of a little bit off kilter. Um, but I think, I mean, and, and the, the detail, the level of detail, comes from the handwriting, not the other way around. Um, but the way that you know my attention focuses on the individual microscopic elements of every particular event, even if they don't come across clearly to the audience, even if they aren't always going to be reliably performable, of course, um, it's in it's an attitude of, for me, it's a, it's you know another one of these words I wouldn't have used when I in my you know in my. Uh, obnoxious phase in, in early 21st century, but it's, it's a, it has nothing to do with love. It has to do with sort of attention and it has to do with um, paying, you know, being, it is almost an emotional investment in the material for me. Um, in the, and when I show a score to a performer or to a, you know, to a viewer or a score reader or whatever, and, you know, I think it becomes sort of mutely clear that every one of these things is something that I've taken a lot of time to draw and to, to trace out in pencil and to draw in pen. Um, and it takes ages. And uh, it means that I've thought about all these things and I felt all these things in my body, you know. And uh, the, same, the same can be said for the rhythms. Um, but are there, I mean, are there concrete questions about the notation or about... You know, well, it's more, I think, just walking through some of the things that, that people may not have seen before, but, but also... Well, like, for example, the very first note, the yes. circular note-head, that's yes. not a standard note-head, that's, yes. I think I know what that means, but I think... <laughs> well, that's the second escapement mechanism attack that I, that I described, um, yes. where he is, is partially depressed, and then that the, you know, the, the... Well, this is, in this part of this piece, the right hand and left hand, so the first gesture of this piece is preparing that, presumably silently, the excellent on the stem down here, this is prepared with an attack or something similar on the string, um, so... It's one of these sort of uh, left hand crosses over, right at the top of the keyboard. Left, right hand is perfectly prepared this note and play and depress the rest of the way simultaneously. Um, the X's are the sort of taps on the key itself. Um, and this, this takes a moment to realize what's going on. Um, but when it does come back, yeah, this is the, as I mentioned before, the Ideally, sound, though not necessarily manipulation of the key, the sort of silent trill below the second escapement um, cutoff point. And then this triangle is the lifting of the key. So there's really a sort of very intricate ballet. Um, and you know, I had the, the piece I performed at Huddersfield yesterday, 
Um, for example, what happens in the, the beginning of that piece is the Sopranos, the piece for voice and piano, and the Sopranos sings actually little events for a couple of minutes. It's based you know, every you know, five to 12 seconds or so in, in, in a regular series. And then there's a big pause, and then the pianist comes in finally, and what the pianist does is like, yeah, um, it's, I, I, it's delightfully obnoxious, but um, <laughs> but there is a very intricate, very precisely notated sort of little miniature micro ballet going on um, of all these things that do everything but play the key in a technically appropriate, you know, traditional fashion. And it's all, you know, for me, it's all part of one one thing, you know, the the nested tuplets and the the very subtle techniques and the handwriting and the detail and the articulation things. Um, it is all just a, among many other things, it's an attempt to refocus the attention of everyone concerned, of the performer, of the audience, of the story reader again, um, on uh, how everything about the music, and by extension everything about all music, which is another one of my plumbings I can deliver to you on request, um, is you know, worthy of attention, right? That, that rewards attention that, and, the, and when things are done slightly askew, one of the things that it does is hopefully it reframes when things are done normally, um, you know, in scare quotes. It reframes that as the incredibly complex and not to be taken for granted um, multi-layered ballet that it is. That's great, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I guess I, I will double up for students in the room that care and attention to notation doesn't have to look like this. <laughs> <laughs> it would be wonderful if it did, but it can. But care and attention should yeah. come across. Do you want to say something about the Dolce and Timo and the, I, I noticed on the Quasi Brillante, on the Arpeggio, uh, uh, just in general the use of these oh, the, aphorisms? Yeah. yeah, this is, well, this is something that I've gotten a lot of flack for over the years. Um, <laughs> this, this is I'm using Italian in particular. Um, so there are two layers to this. I mean, first of all, um, the fact that they're everywhere, that almost every event has its own little expressive indication is, again, part of this general attitude of sort of care and love and attention for every passing moment, right, in every passing event. Um, and, you know, over the course of, you know, in, in line with my instinct over the past decade or whatever, you know, to think of things in more human terms and less theoretical terms, there has been this vast increase in the use of words like intimo and amoroso and delicato and sort of warm, warm words. You know, I'm not, and I look at these books from the early 21st century about being about, you know, violence and, and clenched fists and things with a little bit of hesitation. But the Italian, I, I've, yeah, I, um, yeah, so that's, that's part one. Part two is the insistence on doing them in Italian. And for me, that is another thing um, that I've sort of found myself doing instinctively as a way of paying attention to notation because, you know, in our traditional notational system, just as traditional in some sense as the five-line staff and the insane system of sharps and flats and things, is, are these words like adagio, right, and andante and presto, and andante, you know, it's not a tempo indication, it's a normal Italian participle, it means walking, you know, um, and it mean, the point being that it means more than a metronome does, it means more than a number does, and so what this does for me is I, you know, inspired by that or in reference to that or you know, sort of following on to that, I developed for myself um, the sort of, it's vastly enlarged, but it is still a sort of vocabulary. You know, it's, it's not, there's a, there a relatively limited, relatively compared to the Italian language itself, the actual language that people actually speak. This is a, you know, sandbox Italian, it's a toy Italian, right? There are a couple dozen adjectives that I use over and over again um, as a way of categorizing things, just like, you know, there's a, there's a limited set of tempo indications, like Legro, Andante, you know, Largo, whatever. Um, and it's a way of drawing connections between things. Sometimes they're used in ways that are not, you know, that are not merely amplifying or underlining the, what's actually happening, but they're in contradiction to it. Or they're, um, I, I often use, I like to use expressive indication over long silences. Um, I was talking to Ben yesterday, actually, the pianist, about how uh, I, one thing I've done a lot in, in the piece that I wrote that he played yesterday, and in this piece, I think also a couple of times maybe, is I have a long silence that has the word amoroso, you know, loving over it. And Ben told me that he found himself when he was rehearsing these pieces, whenever he saw a sign that had an amoroso on it, he tilt his head to the left. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, 15 degrees, you know, and so Mulder amoroso becomes 23 degrees. Um, <laughs> and thinking, without even realizing that's what he was doing. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, which again ties back, I, I like to do these things with notation that are not, that don't have concrete musical sounding effects, right? That, for example, putting an expressive indication over a rest. It doesn't mean anything on a recording necessarily. It doesn't mean anything um, if you're sitting in a hall, not having seen the score, not knowing you know, that aspect of the work, 
But one thing that I will, um, I have a lot of things that I'll insist on, is the third polemic I think deliver, is that um, the score means more than it sounds. Um, there's more to writing down a score than the, the sound that comes out the other end. It is um, If we are doing notated composition as in a more or less traditional context, right, the score is where the center of gravity of our work is. It's, what, it's where we give up control, right, to some degree. And um, I like the idea, and this is one of the one of the things I like about that always appealed to me about medieval music in sort of before things got standardized in the 18th to 19th century, um, is how things happen in scores all the time that don't sound like anything, that don't mean anything in that sort of utilitarian modern sense, but they are there because the score is not just about sound, the score is a document, the score is an object. Um, it can have meaning that exceed. Yeah. Any other questions? There's a bunch of things to cut off, but I, I'm, I'm just waiting for other people. <laughs> <laughs> I think you might as well ask them. There's one at the back. Yeah. Oh, yes. Um, so I kind of have a pretty awkward time, but I just had one question. Sure. At some point, you mentioned about there being two people, I think, and I'm not sure if. So, if it, or if it was just one person, is this being played on the actual keys of the piano, or is this being played as the knobs inside the piano and with two people? Is there one person on the keys and the other on the knobs, or they both on the keys? It's just one person. Um, one person at the keyboard. Um, I might mention the two hands. Maybe that's what you're thinking of. Um, it's possible. Uh, but it's also a good opportunity to, to say, to point out, um, in case anyone was wondering or had, had this in the back of their mind about the inside of the piano and the strings and the, and the dampers. Um, I, won't, I won't do that. The keyboard, I've never, I've never done that um, because one of the many things that I'm neurotic about in my work is, is how is the stage presence of the performer. Um, I'm always, you know, for one thing, I'm always on people to sort of not be theatrical, not, you know, if, if they're playing something very quietly, it doesn't sound, don't exaggerate, don't, you know, don't, you know, it's not important that, that to, make, to make sure everyone sees everything, and, you know. But another, another aspect of that is that I, I have this mental block about the, the sort of awkward contortions of playing inside the piano, of the mm -hmm. sort of like, this very, and we've all seen it, I imagine, this sort of like very specific, awkward, hunched over half stand that people do, and then you, and then you sit down again. And as much as I'm interested in you know, hesitations and stumblings and awkwardnesses, that is one step too far, I think. I, that, that, you know, as silly as it is, that is, I, I can't, I just can't bring myself to do it. Yeah. Would you ever write for Sarah Nichols's Inside Out piano then, which uh, alleviates those concerns? Have you, have you seen it? Have you seen I've it? heard of it. I've never seen it in action. Um, I have, I, and I might not know exactly what it is, but I have a vague sense of what it is. Um, I mean, that's just a different instrument, yeah. really, <laughs> at the end of the day. Um, and a similar thing with the, you know, there are pieces, of course, where there are people, you know, standing in, with a great deal of grace and and you know self position and playing the inside of the piano as a, as a you know as a sideways harp um, or something like that. Um, that's just something I've never I've never done. I mean that's that that's, for me that impinges on percussion. This is a particularly expensive percussion instrument, which is a completely separate category from the way I think about things. Yeah. I'm just wondering if you could talk more about your approaches to using the Renaissance and medieval music. Mm. Uh, yeah. Sure. Um, this is well. I've, I've been interested in that in that repertoire for a very long time. I studied it in school. There was, you know, you don't really do sort of secondary courses of study in, in graduate school, at least not in the states. But I, if, if I, if you could, I would have. I took several courses in medieval notation and um, transcribed Charles Camoncet and all this sort of thing. And I love the way it sounds. You know, I like the, the mode of expression. I love. I'm. I love the mode of you know the notation, the score writing. The, as I said, the way things both conceptually and, and notationally exceed the, the remit of just things to be heard. Um, and so I have a lot of pieces, I don't know, maybe a dozen, half a dozen or something, um, that take some, some little bit of Renaissance or medieval material as a source. And historically what I've done with them is taken like, you know, a, a relatively small fragment, a melodic line or a series of harmonies or whatever, and then submitted them to sort of, um, in general, generally speaking, sort of canonic procedures, stretching them out, transposing them microtonally, basically disguising them for most of the time. 
um, because you know, the thinking in a concrete sense, in a purely you know, workshop sense, is that teachers have to come from somewhere. It's always going to be fundamentally arbitrary. Why not? It's, you know, because <laughs> I like it, and that's my prerogative. Um, and it has, you know, sort of private resonance for me with my own, you know, basically canonic technique, which is most how I make most of my pieces, that sort of thing. Um, but more recently, I've gotten more and more interested in this idea of transcription. I mean, these, these, these satellites here um, were the first time I've done it sort of even halfway that explicitly. The piece yesterday at Huddersfield, I wrote it, there's this, you know, the central piece for soprano and piano, and then to go along with it, just to fill out the program, I made um, sort of one and a half transcriptions, relatively straight, actually, at least the full one. Of a of a um, Arsatilio ballad from the late 14th century, where the singer the singer is just singing the you know this 14th century melody, full stop. Um, and this is something I want I'm I'm keen to do more of actually do some transcribing because when I when I had this idea when well I don't remember whose idea it was but when the idea came up to do this to fill out this little program, um, I thought oh that'll be fun I can do that like in a weekend just copy the pictures you know maybe. It was so hard. It was really hard. <laughs> it took so long. It was so stressful. Um, I, I, you know, I often find myself when I'm starting a new project, I'll, I'll have this phase. I feel like it's, now I feel like it sort of has to happen, where I'll, I'll have this sort of crisis of like it is impossible to write music. Like it, it cannot be done. Like there's no way to organize events in time in a coherent fashion. Um, and I had the same thing with like it's what is transcription. What does it mean? Why am I doing this? What's the point? Like, how much can I change it? How much do I have to change it? It was, it was incredibly stressful. Um, but again, I, you know, it's, it's, it's both a utilitarian the source of information for me. It is a homage, a private homage, my own interest as a, essentially a consumer of music. Um, you know, a, a, I've, my CD shelves, um, such as they are, are, you know, Fastly from you know year zero to 1600, and fastly from 1950 to now, and very little in between. Um, and also, again, it's this it's this attitude, the cultural attitude, um, both you know more broadly than music, but also within music of speculation, right, of things, proceed of puzzle canons, procedures that are not meant for listening, that are meant for um, you know. I, I, I share this idea that I feel like a lot of people back then had that music, well, of course. It was kind of the standard at the time that music is not the, the sound of music is only one inst relatively instant aspect of what music can be. It can be so much more. Can I extend a little onto that? And th th feel free to say no, no completely to this. But <laughs> is is it possible to show the linkage, the the process between between where the the material came from mm. and and where it is now? Is it, is it possible to see that the palimpsest, the shadow behind this? What do you mean, to see? I, are you able to show us? No. Um, <laughs> I mean, the I mean, I could I don't because I don't have my sketchbooks with me. Right. It's um. I can but I can describe it generally certainly, um, which is. I mean, in a piece, in a, in a, in a, it might be actually relatively easy to do in a thing like the satellites, um, where, there, where there are fewer steps, basically, and the steps are sort of more transparent. Um, like on this page, the second, oops. That's not the first one. What happens in the two satellites is there's a, in the Grimace Ballade, um, says you produce a difference. The, this is based on a phrase, and it is, it really is a phrase. Um, of, of the blood taken just some, from somewhere in the middle based on you know why I chose it, I don't really remember. You know, something like that. And everything you see here, basically all the all the tuplets and all the all the things are just me, I think in this case fairly intuitively dislocating things. Um, just taking what is in the ballad, of course, even though it is relatively rhythm rhythmically complex by 15th, 14th century, well, certainly by 15th century standards, um, it is still, you know, just basically notes, you know, um, and syncopating things and offsetting things. This is, for me, you know, these little things here, these little um, the bits with the very short rest, where the, I mentioned this before, where the note comes after the rest and nothing happens at the beginning of a bar, at the beginning of, um, of a grouping. That, to me, is a category of articulation, so it's a it's a it's a hitch, right? It's not quite a syncopation because there's not a beat per se, so there's nothing to syncopate against really. But and you can't hear it, of course. You're not you don't see the story. You'll never know that the rest are there. That you know, this rest is meaningless to a listener coming at this one the first time in a concert hall. Um, 
But when you're, when you're playing this, of course, there's a downbeat in your head, right? And, um, and when you hit that B flat, followed by that G, it's but um, you're falling, right? You're falling forward, essentially. And so articulating, again, this is the, the micro level in which you think about these things. Instead of hitting that B flat with this degree of sort of competent mastery that the downbeat implies, you know? The downbeat is a statement. The downbeat is a, is a thesis statement of purpose, right? Um, when, when things happen for me, um, maybe this sounds insane to everyone else, but when things happen to me, it just shift ever so slightly in these groupings, it becomes a question of, of um, you know, of stumbling forward, of catching up, of things being a little bit off kilter. And then when things happen on a downbeat, like this B flat here, the downbeat of the second bar, um, and well, maybe the better example is the one before it here, then that is something that is, in my own conception, is sort of a, um, it's an unusual moment of statuesque stability. You know, it's an orientation point for a broader thing. And, you know, again, this is one of dozens of aspects of the way I write um, these days in a piece like this, where you could very justifiably say, you know, when I'm sitting in St. Paul's Hall at Huddersfield, what difference does that sort of consideration make? And the answer is, I have no idea. Um, and I don't really care. I, it's, <laughs> um, because there's a, there's a level of discourse for me going on that is, um, there's an effect on the music, on what you hear on the CD or whatever is, Subtle to the quite possible point of absolute indetectability, but it's still for you very important as to know what's going on. And similarly, in, in terms of pitch choices, so the, the pitches that are in your work that aren't in the original, yeah. it, is there any kind of systematicity to that? Less and less um, as the years go by. Um, I used to be, you know, back in the days of the you days, know, the, the bit in, the, in that old piece where the, where the pitches are sort of going down the keyboard and this individual going boom, 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 that's all worked out. There's graph paper, there are charts, there are numbers, you know. Yeah. The, every, those streams of tuplets were generated by computer as sort of Brownian motion, it's changing by one or two elements at a time. Um, I just accepted their output and that's, um, and their bar line, wherever they happened to be bar line, where they happened, the three streams happened to coincide. Um, and I was used to be very neurotic about sort of everything, like I can't proceed until everything is justified. And this is a very common, you know, this, this sort of mode of thinking whereby um, it's, it's fundamentally an insecurity, like the, whereby if, if I can't justify things rationally, then they could be anything and I have to stop, because you know? <laughs> I can't justify things otherwise. Um, but more recently, in every, in every way, but you know, in pitch as in, um, in some respects, in rhythmic structure and things like this, it's become a lot more sort of free and intuitive. Partially, I think, just the natural consequence of knowing what I'm doing in a way. Like I know how to, I know the results that I want. So if I, you know, I can, um, I can set up systems of limitation and systems of predetermined um, configurations. But in a piece like this, when well, these pitches are all directly from Ramos, but even in the in the main movements, um, you know, the pitches that are sort of alongside the main melody, which is derived from Ramos, those are often just pictures that seem to be coherent with the general strand of things as they are going. You know, um, a, uh, like at the, at the opening of the piece, or you know, the F, the opening F and the opening um, E and the opening D, like happens over there, are, this, you know, it's, it's dislocated, but it's just, that's all it is, it's, that's from, you know, 1392 or whatever. But then, you know, when things start getting added alongside the, the D flat and, and the C, that's just me riffing, basically. Yeah. That's, that's me adding things marginally alongside. That notion of the unheld having an effect on the performance, it makes me think of Norman's quartet, where he's got yeah. the held alone fragments of text, which are for them, yeah. but not for not for the audience. I saw this really, really irate guy complaining <laughs> in a question and answer with Norman's wife, <laughs> um, saying, why don't we get even a copy of the Heldelin in the program note? And our ditty was saying, well, that's just, it's not for you, yeah. it's for me. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's like a performance indication, actually, in some way. Yeah. And that's a very medieval, you know, yeah. attitude as well. I mean, you know, there's, there are all sorts of medieval manuscripts that have not just illuminations and decorations or general opulence and things, um, but specifically notational practices about coloration and, and things that don't have any concrete meaning whatsoever. But they're also very consistently applied, and to this day, people, you know, I think I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not. A, I'm not an expert in the subject, but um, it's my understanding that there's a lot of debate still as to what exactly the purpose was. Um, which is, I like. I like that idea. I like. I mean, as is probably obvious from everything about what you're currently looking at, I have a great deal of distrust for the idea of efficiency in, in musical discourse. Yeah. 
Um, Kyle Gann, I'm um, this American political critic and writer who's someone who I have a great deal of distaste for, in a lot of, not personally, but as a, as a writer, and his, his aesthetics and his priorities I, I, are not, no, they're, they're not for me, and that's fine. Um, but that having been said, he, uh, one of the curious things that, on this topic I've ever read was Kyle Gann quoting somebody else, I mean, it's not, he doesn't get the credit, um, thankfully, but something about how, you know, I think it was Feldman, someone's was complaining about his notation. Um, and you know, why this could be written much more clearly, much more efficiently. And the person said, you know, efficiency is something you want in garbage collection. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, you know. um, and, you know, I, I'm inclined to agree with that. I'm conscious that we have squeezed you very hard uh, for nearly two hours of your time. <laughs> Are there any final questions? I have a quick question. Yes, please. go ahead. Um, so I really like your pieces, and I've never really seen any sort of pieces that delicate, like lots of silences and little gestures that I really like that. But uh, just just as you pulled up the score, I noticed one thing. Um, that silence at the right corner is six seconds, right? Is it? Eight. This one? Is it eight seconds? Eight. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and that one's five seconds. I was just wondering, like, is this like a very intuitive sort of um, position, or have you really just sort of timed yourself to feeling for the music and write that down? Because those are, I mean, those are not calculated. Those are intuitively sort of um, determined, but they're, they're also often at sort of great cost of blood, sweat, and tears. Um, there's, there's, there's things like this when I'm writing um, that often get changed over and over and over again. You know, the, in the drafts. Um, I, the way I work, speaking of inefficiency, is I'll, I'll write out the entire piece in pencil and graph paper and write and draw all the staves and all the things and measure everything precisely so I can see how things line up in theory. Um, and then if I, if I revise, if I decide something doesn't work, then I just, I write the whole thing out again. Um, yeah, um, whatever. But there'll, there'll be a formata in the score, in the, in the pencil score or whatever, and it'll, it'll say eight seconds, and I'll come back the next day, and I'll accomplish nothing for two hours, and, I'll, and then I'll erase the eight and write a 15, and I'll come the next day and turn it back to eight. And you know, it's, it's, um, but no, it's just, a, it's just a sense for me of the weight of things, really, you know. Um, it's again, it's the question of feeling the passing of time. How much, how much time um, that the you know the difference or the, the interval between this and this, how much time it can bear, you know, and you know if it's if it's too long, I mean, it's not a question for me of boredom. I'm not so worried about that. But it's, it's a question. Then a certain line gets snapped, right? And then this gesture bears more responsibility. It bears more structural weight. It bears more. The consequences have to stem from here instead of from up here. And this becomes sort of a very delicate balance. Um, and you know, it's not necessarily the case that I always get these things right, but they, they do come. It's you know, there's a false dichotomy between things being determined structurally and things being intuitive. You know, <laughs> intuitive doesn't mean easy. Right? In fact, it can be quite the opposite. Okay. Yeah. Super. Okay. Uh, let's thank you once again. Then thank you very much.